The, the sad reality is, is there may be even a greater need, as this headline says here, for foster parents in the months to come for a number of reasons. Um, certainly, um, the impact of coronavirus on the health of, of existing foster parents or the economic impact may have forced them to step aside from this process. And so we're going to need more foster parents um, to jump in and, and assist with um, taking, filling up um, that gap. Um, during this time, We've seen in some states a 50% reduction in reports of child abuse, and it's not necessarily because there are fewer cases of abuse, but there are fewer portals, portals of getting that information into the agencies. So frequently, um, people will see abuse in, in a classroom. A teacher will see abuse and report it, and that will get the process going. Or a, a pediatrician or a doctor will see something, and they'll make a report, and that gets that process going of moving a child into the child welfare system. All of those portals have had the doors have closed a little bit, and so we will inevitably see, we believe we'll see, when and when all of the doors start to open back up, we'll begin to see um, a, a significant and quick increase of children coming into the foster care system. So we're also going to need um, families to step forward and take those children in um, as, as um, foster children. But the good news is, is as you get into this process, the best start, I think, is to think about becoming a foster parent. You, under, you learn very quickly what the child welfare system is all about, what resources are available, what the process processes are. Um, and you also get children in your home that quite honestly, frequently, those children may come in and they have not yet been freed for adoption. But at some point in a foster placement, they may be freed for adoption. And there's no better way to, to smoothly make a transition for this child than have a foster parent who already knows that child, who's come to love the child, and can now take that next step and adopt. So Um, in regards to COVID-19, um, there is limited data on the risk of COVID-19 in the first and second trimester of pregnancy because it is new. But studies from China and a small number of pregnant patients with COVID-19 have not demonstrated increased severity of the infection during pregnancy. And recently published cases of babies born to mothers with COVID-19 have shown none of the babies tested positive for the virus. The virus was also not detected in cord blood or breast milk. If a pregnant patient got very sick, the health and well-being of the fetus could be affected, but the age group of women pregnant and pregnancy does not seem to be a high risk group. I think now, I think always is a good time to do so. <laughs> like I definitely encourage to do your research. Um, and uh, I think, like I said in my um, part of my presentation is that what, I think it's most important that you're looking for agencies like a really great place to start is uh, the human rights campaign um, and I think is specifically looking to see if they have the innovative um, level seal of approval. These are agencies who have done everything that they can to, to show that they are affirming and inclusive. It's one of the proudest things that we have ever done at Choice Network. Um, and so I think that that's a really great place to start. And then also just to really ask them specific questions about um, the type of families that they serve and, you know, just check out their website, make sure they're being loud and proud, you know, just do your research. Mm -hmm. That would be my um, I always tell folks that like an adoption process is a huge like emotional investment like finding an agency and choosing and committing to that agency it's also a big financial investment as well as a time investment so you want to be sure that it just feels like a comfortable fit for you um, and I think that you you will get a sense from an agency when when you inquire with them. Um, also be thinking about, um, again, about the child that you are, feel like you're prepared to parent. And, you know, it's important to ask questions about like, what are the, some of the common risk factors that you see amongst the children that you place? And, it, you know, maybe that is kind of more across the board, there's probably similar um, just risks and unknowns in adoption. Um, if you're thinking about transracial adoption, if, and if you would be well equipped to to child to parent a child who's a different race than you, then you know be thinking about asking those kinds of questions about the demographics of 
of the children that are placed through the program. Um, you know, I think that at Spence, we have a really strong philosophy around how we work with the birth parent and they are so, um, I think that that's a lot of our, the way that we prepare our families is to really understand their process and, you know, understand kind of what, what they, where they're coming from with this. And we are also big advocates of open adoption. This is a perfect time to, to get information, to go to everybody has websites. You've got a choice in the foster care system between the public agencies, the county or state agencies and private agencies. Most public agencies contract at some level or another with private agencies, either to do foster care placement or adoption or other services. So you've got a, a really wide range of choices. Um, I think, you know, through the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, we fund currently in all 50 states about 100 different organizations. We've done the vetting on those. We know they're good at organizations. In order to get a contract with us, they have to sign a non-discrimination statement. So a good place to start is just the, you know, our website with, and it has a list of all the agencies with whom we contract. But but there are lots more than those as well. You know, a good sign during normal times when it's not a COVID-19 environment is, do you get a phone call back? How long does it, how many times do you have to call in order to get information? And if, and if it takes too many times think about moving to another organization because that's a it's sort of a, a first sign of what kind of responsiveness you're going to get from an agency home studies are done state by state and they do differ state by state but there is kind of like a long list of documents that the agency is required to um to gather from you and those are things like your birth certificate if you're married we would need like an original copy of your marriage certificate we run a few clearances on you a criminal history clearance as well as um a child abuse clearance um that with the state and state again state to state there might be more additional clearances that would be run as well um, we have you do a medical exam um, and submit a report. Um, we're, we're taking a look at finances just to be sure that it, it's a financially secure home that, you know, adding a child to would not, uh, you know, put any any great burden on, on the family. So it's really a compilation of looking at those documents to assess your family. Um, but we also are talking to you about adoption themes and, you know, what it, you know, kind of what your um, parenting style is going to be like, how you're going to talk to uh, the child about adoption or foster care, things like open adoption to help you prepare for that. Um, so it's not only an assess, it, essentially it is an assessment from the agency that's that's completing the home study, but it's also a bit of a self-assessment and really taking a look at what your capacities are as a parent. Um, and, you know, I think that it is a lot of, you know, kind of hoops to jump, jump through, but I do think that families find it to be you know, a valuable process too, to prepare them for adoptive parenting or foster care. I would just say that, um, that what we have found in this moment is that everything still needs to be done. Nothing is being skipped. So it's not, you know, like background sh checks still need to be done. We talked about that. Monica said they just have a few places families can go to, same here in Ohio. So I think, and then the, everything is essentially being done virtually that can be done. But um, just talking about that one piece of the home, that's where we can't, we have to be able to go in and view the home. Fire departments have to be able to enter and we have to be able to view the home. Um, and so that's, it's essentially uh, what we're seeing is states are sort of like, just like what is the bare minimum that, minimum that can be done. And our states, Ohio specifically is saying, you need to, you can't touch anything. You have to wear a mask. They have to open doors for you and you should be in, in for 15 minutes or less. So there's no real conversation. It's just check the home and then everything else is done virtually. And this really varies from country to country and program to pro program, but there have been significant delays um, to I'd say most of the, the programs and that's generally because of travel restrictions um, that have been put in place and um, families unable, you know, for a lot of international programs, families have to travel and spend a, a good amount of time in country before an adoption is able to take place. Um, so with restriction of borders closing and travel in general, uh, that has really had an impact on adoption. Um, I can speak to the the two countries that Spence Chapin has. Colombia is one of our uh, the countries that we work in and they are still happening remotely um, with our 
Col adoptions through Columbia. Um, families are obviously not traveling right there right now, but the, um, a lot of the paperwork is still happening. We are still accepting ref um, applications to that program and referrals are happening even though families aren't able to travel at this time. Uh, Spence Chapin also has an international program in South Africa that is open to LGBTQ placements. Um, and that is a country that has, for the time being, and this just happened last week, had put a pause on all adoption activity. So, um, which is unfortunate. And so for, you know, it's a stressful thing for folks that are currently in that program. Um, and just in good faith right now, um, because of that uh, announcement that was made last week, Spence Chapin isn't taking new applications for our South Africa program. Um, but, you know, we imagine that's gonna change over time. I think a lot of the um, things that Rita mentioned about how kids in the foster care in the US are impacted um, by COVID just in like, in especially folks or kids that live in group homes um, or have like multiple uh, foster care placements um, are just more susceptible because they are, you know, maybe, maybe in contact with more people. Um, so these kids really are at risk. And also a lot of the, the children that are available for an international adoption do have um, increased health needs and that, you know, they, so they might be more at risk for COVID as well. Um, and so, you know, I would say certainly international programs are being impacted but i don't i also don't want to veer you away from that option if that is something that is really appealing to you um i think that in international adoption like domestic adoption kind of it's you want to expect the unexpected and so i you know i think that um it's so out of our control what can what rules go into effect in other countries but you know we do anticipate that it'll open up and it um you know the there are international programs that are a great option for uh, LGBTQ families.